Hello, welcome to the course SJPHY2B02 Mechanics 2. The contents of this course is taken from an introduction to mechanics by Kleppner and Polenko. We will continue to discuss topics from module 3, Harmonic Oscillator. In the last class, we set up the, the equation of motion for a harmonic oscillator, a simple harmonic oscillator to be precise. Then we solved it uh, using appropriate boundary conditions. In today's class, let's derive the expressions for its kinetic and potential energies. So in general, the potential energy function can be expanded as an infinite series known as a Taylor series. So if x0 is the equilibrium position, you can write u of x as u of x0 plus x minus x0 du by dx at x0 plus x minus x0 square by 2 factorial d square u by dx square at x0 plus x minus x0 whole cube divided by 3 factorial d to the power 3 u by dx cube at x0 all the way to infinity. Now here if the oscillations are small, then the value of x minus x0 is going to be very, very small, which means you can neglect all the higher order terms. So all the terms starting with the third order can be eliminated. Now, if you look at the, the remaining terms, the first three terms, here du by dx, if u is the potential energy, the gradient of potential energy is nothing but the force, right? So du by dx at x0, at equilibrium position, the force is zero. So the derivative is going to be zero. So the second term also vanishes. So you are left with u of x equal to u of x0 plus x minus x0 whole square by 2 factorial d square u by dx square at x0. Now in the case of a harmonic oscillator, the second derivative of the potential energy at the equilibrium position is nothing but the effective spring constant k. So when you make this substitution, your equation becomes simpler, u of x equal to u of x naught plus half k into x minus x naught square. Now let's choose x naught equal to zero as the x equal to zero as the equilibrium position. So your expression for potential energy now becomes u of x equal to u of 0 plus half k x squared. Now without the loss of generality, let's, let's take the potential energy to be 0 at x equal to 0. So what happened? u of 0 is going to vanish. Now you have uh, the standard form for the, the potential energy of a harmonic oscillator, u of x equal to half k x squared. Now from the previous class, we know x equal to a cos omega naught t plus phi. So when you substitute for x, you get u equal to half k a square cos square omega naught t plus phi. Now graphically, this is a, a, a second order function, a quadratic function which corresponds to a parabola as shown as the blue curve in this figure. So at the equilibrium position, you have the minimum potential energy. That's why we say the force is also zero here. And at the turning points, it has the maximum potential energy. Moving on to kinetic energy, which is half mv square. V is nothing but dx by dt, which is minus omega naught a sine omega naught t plus phi. So the expression for kinetic energy is half m omega naught square a square sine square omega naught t plus phi. But omega naught square is k by m. So instead of m omega naught square, I can write k. So the expression for potential energy now becomes half k a square sine square omega naught t plus phi. Now if you if you plot this, you, you will get, once again, this is a second order function, a parabolic function, but this is going to be an inverted parabola represented by this red curve. So here, at the equilibrium position, it has the maximum kinetic energy because 
speed is highest at the equilibrium position. But at the turning point, it comes to a halt, so the velocity goes to zero. Consequently, the kinetic energy is minimum or zero at the turning points. So these two curves are complementary. The total energy is a sum of kinetic and potential energies. So this is half Ka square, which is a common term multiplied by cos square omega naught t plus phi plus sine square omega naught t plus phi. Cos square theta plus sine square theta equal to one. So total energy E equal to half Ka square. So if you look at the figure, at every point, if you add these two curve, you get a constant value indicated by this light blue horizontal line. So, in the case of a simple harmonic oscillator, the total energy is a constant. Why this happens? Because the motion takes place under the influence of the restoring force along. And if you look at the, the expression for restoring force minus kx, this is a conservative force. So, in the case of any motion under a conservative force field, the total energy is a constant of motion. So you get a, a constant energy in this particular case. But many a time, you are interested in, in the average value rather than uh, the instantaneous value. For example, if you take a light wave, it consists of electric and magnetic fields. Both the fields, both the fields are varying sinusoidal, so almost like uh, like the solution of a harmonic oscillator, a sinusoidal function. But the frequency of light is very, very high. It's of the order of 10 to the power of 14 hertz, which means in one second, the electric field is going to vary 10 to the power of 14 times. Therefore, it is practically impossible to measure the instantaneous value. In such cases, uh, it's, it makes more practical sense to talk about the average value of the electric field. So in the case of a harmonic oscillator also, if the oscillations are very fast, instead of instantaneous values, we need to talk about the average values. Now, how do you define the time average value? So consider a general function f of t, which varies in an interval t1 to t2. Now the time average value of f of t is defined as uh, as the function within a pair of angled brackets. So if you look at this graph, this curve is the actual function f of t and the time average value is denoted by this horizontal dotted line. Now if you take the average, if you take the, the area under the actual curve within the interval, and that area is going to be exactly the same as the area enclosed by this rectangle, which is nothing but your the average value of the function. Right? So you take area under this curve from T1 to T2, that's going to be exactly the same as the, the rectangular area defined by the average value. So that's, that's how the time average value is defined. Now, what is the area under the curve f of t it's nothing but integral from t1 to t2 f of t dt this is the area under the actual curve now what is the area under the the average value the area under the average value is nothing but this rectangular area how do you find area of a rectangle it's a product of the two sides so this side is t2 minus t1 and this side is constant which is average of f so the rectangular area is T2 minus T1 multiplied by average of F, which is equal to integral T1 to T2 F of T dt. From this, I can get a, a definition for average value of F as 1 by T2 minus T1 integral T1 to T2 F of T dt. Let's quickly find out time average values of some of the famous function. First, let's Let's find the average of sine theta. Now, if you plot the sine function, so you can see this is the sinusoidal variation. So one complete cycle is from zero to two pi, right? After that, the same function is going to repeat. Okay. So here, the lower limit is going to be zero and the upper limit is going to be two pi. So if you take T2 minus T1 or upper limit minus lower limit, that's going to be two pi. So the average of sine theta 
can be defined as 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi sin theta d3. Integral of sin theta is minus cos theta. When you apply the limits, you get the value 0. You can also find the average value qualitatively. How? You plot the sin function and we know that the average value is related to the integral and integral is nothing but area under the curve. So basically, you need to find area under this sine curve. So if you look at uh, the graph here, so you have positive area here, negative area here, equal amount of positive and negative areas. So when you take the sum of these two, you get zero. Since the area under the curve is zero, average value is also zero. So that's how you get an estimate quantitative. Same way, using the definition, you can find the average value of cos theta. This is a homework for you. And when you follow this procedure, you will find that the average of cos theta is also zero. Next average of sine square theta, which is defined as 1 over 2 pi integral 0 to 2 pi sine square theta d theta. And you can write sine square theta as 1 minus cos 2 theta by 2. So make this substitution. 2 is a constant. You take it outside the integral. So you have 1 over 2 pi. And integral of 1 minus cos 2 theta is nothing but theta minus sine 2 theta by 2. You apply the limits, so you get the value half. So, time average of sine square theta is half. Once again, cos square theta you can do as a homework, follow the same procedure. The expansion for cos square theta is 1 plus cos 2 theta by 2. So, when you do the math, you get once again the average value as half. You can also do this uh, qualitatively using the graph. So if you plot sine square theta, this is the graph you're going to get. And if you plot cos square theta, you get a similar graph. The only difference is instead of starting from 0, it will start from 1. Then you have one complete cycle and it ends at the value 1. Now if you take the, the area under both the curves, they are going to be exactly the same. You know the famous trigonometric relation sine square theta plus cos square theta equal to 1. Now if you take the average on either side, so average of sine square theta plus average of cos square theta is going to be average of 1 which is 1. So we know that the average of these two should sum up to 1. And we also know from the graph that the area under sine square and cos square functions are exactly same which means their time average values are also going to be same. Right? So we know two things. One, time average values of sine square and cos square are same. Second, they should sum up to 1, which means each of this has to be half. So average of sine square theta is half, average of cos square theta equal to half. Okay. So once you get a hang of uh, how to calculate the time average values, we can now move on to find the average energies of a simple harmonic oscillator. Now, if you, if you look at the potential and kinetic energies, you have cos square and sine square functions. And now we know that their average value is going to be half. So let's consider one complete period of oscillation, which is from 0 to t where t is nothing but 2 pi by omega. Here omega is the angular frequency. Or if you want to consider the argument as omega t, then omega t is going to vary from 0 to 2 pi. Okay. Now potential energy is half k a square cos square omega naught t plus phi. So the time average of potential energy is going to be half k a square is a constant so you don't have to bother about its average value the average of cos square is going to be half so half into half k a square which is going to be 1 by 4 k a square same way the the average of kinetic energy is half k a square sine square omega naught t plus phi so its average is going to be half k a square multiplied by the average of sine square function which is half. Once again you get the average value of 
potential energy has 1 by 4 k a square. Total energy is anyway a constant, so you don't have to bother about its average energy. So from this you can note that the average value of potential energy is same as the average value of kinetic energy provided the only force acting on the system is the restoring force which is a conservative force. The entire story we have discussed so far happens in the absence of friction because we consider only the restoring force here which is a conservative force. The story is going to change completely if you include the effect of friction because friction is a non-conservative force. So you will find that uh, the friction is going to act against the motion. In fact, the harmonic oscillator which we have discussed so far is an ideal model, it's a mathematical model as I said in the beginning. If you take any practical oscillator like a simple pendulum or a clock pendulum, there is some amount of friction acting in the system and friction is going to resist your motion so it's going to act as a, a damping force. That's why all the practical oscillators are known as damped harmonic oscillators. So in the next class what we will do, we will set up the equation of motion of a damped harmonic oscillator. We will solve it and using the solution we will derive the expressions for the kinetic and potential energies. So stay tuned. Thank you.